Um, all of you out there, uh, welcome to the uh, one more in the series of science and medicine lectures. Uh, today, we're very fortunate to have uh, Jim Hurley here uh, to speak with us. Uh, Jim uh, joined the Department of Biochemistry here at uh, UW School of Medicine uh, in about 1985 and has um, really had his uh, professional career here. Prior to that, he uh, did a PhD um, at uh, University of Illinois, uh, Department of uh, P-Bio, um, uh, and finished that in 1979. Um, but uh, started life, Jim, I guess, as a chemist with a BS in chemistry uh, from uh, uh, the SUNY College of Environmental Science and, and Forestry. Um, after that time, Jim went and did, uh, after the PhD, a series of postdocs at a uh, reasonably sound institution. Um, uh, first at Stanford and then at uh, UC San Diego and following that at Caltech before, as I said, he came and started his career as a faculty member here at uh, University of Washington. Jim, for about 20 years, um, uh, focused on uh, the biochemistry of phototransduction. But then um, around 2007 or so, um, he really uh, uh, started maybe a, a second professional scientific life in, in migrating um, into uh, how retinas manage metabolic energy. And that led to the discovery, the realization that uh, the retina and neighboring retinal uh, pigment epithelium uh, function together uh, synergistically in a metabolic ecosystem. And that's what uh, Jim is going to be uh, talking to us uh, about today. Let me do one little bit of uh, housekeeping. And that is, as we, particularly as we get to the end and you want to ask questions, please register those in the Q&A. Uh, those questions uh, all get recorded there and will be part of the posting. Uh, but uh, please use the Q&A and we'll monitor both Q&A and chat. So Jim, and take it away. Okay, share the screen. Great, we can see it. So you can see it? Yep. Okay. And the, uh, you can see the pointer? Uh, yes. And you can see this one? Uh, yep. Okay. And Make sure the slides advance. Slides are not advancing. Uh, oh boy. Oh, there we, there we go. Did that advance? Yes, it did. Okay. Good. Okay. Now I'll go back. Okay. So I think I'm ready to start. And yeah, well, thanks. Thanks very much for uh, for the introduction, and thanks very much for the uh, invitation uh, to present this. And uh, so I'll, I'll just start off with a. Um, uh, describing an experiment that uh, Michelle Giamarco and, um, uh, did, it did a, f a few years ago and uh, with, with help from Christine Santelis and, and, uh, and Sue Barkerhoff. And uh, in this experiment, what, uh, what Michelle did was she took this, uh, this fluorescent glucose. Um, it's shown, it's, uh, in these slides, it's, it's fluorescing in magenta. Um, and they uh, stuck it in a syringe and they uh, gavaged it into uh, into a, a, a zebrafish uh, stomach. And they, they did a similar kind of experiment with, um, uh, with mice. So they did this with both uh, fish and with, uh, with mice. And, and so then what they did was they euthanized the animal. Uh, they uh, uh, dissected out the eye, uh, split the eye into uh, retina and eye cup. And I'm gonna talk about this now because uh, we're, we're, uh, throughout the, uh, the seminar, I'll be uh, mentioning the eye cup. So this is the, uh, you, you cut the eye, cut the front part of the eye off, and then you take out the retina, and that leaves this layer that uh, I'll be talking about a lot about, uh, called the pig retinal pigment epithelium. And so in this, in these experiments, she took the retina and she laid it out flat uh, on a piece of filter paper, and then uh, and then cut slices, and then turned the slices on her slide on, on her side, and and visualized them with a, a fluorescence confocal microscope. So that's the uh, the experiment. This is what. Um, uh, not advancing now. Oop, okay, and this is what they uh, and this is what this is what she found. So uh, maybe this doesn't make a whole lot of sense to you because I look at the names and I think some of you are familiar with the uh, uh, the structure of the retina and maybe uh, uh, some of you aren't so familiar with it. Uh, well, and so um, 
so link to the structure of the retina first. So uh, this here is, uh, th this part is not shown on this slide, but this is the where the blood is. Uh, so, uh, so if you imagine the eyeball, it's got the white part there, the sclera, and then this part right here is just inside the sclera. That's where the, uh, the blood flow is. It's called the choroid, choriocapillaris. It's all these uh, little capillaries made with endothelial cells and, and the capillaries are fenestrated. So they let uh, nutrients flow from the uh, choroid through uh, this layer here called the Brooks membrane, which is a collagen and elastin, and it's pretty porous. So the, the nutrients get from the blood through, the, uh, uh, through there, but then there's this monolayer of uh, cells called the retinal pigment epithelial cells. And so those cells are held together uh, by tight junctions. And so in order for nutrients to get through uh, those cells, they have to have transporters, like glucose transporters, for example. And if the uh, nutrients get through, then they can get into the retina. And the first layer of cells that they hit is the photoreceptor cells. And so that's, that's the photoreceptor layer right there. And then these green cells here, uh, I, I highlight them in green. Those are, those are the, uh, the glial cells. And they go all the way from where the photoreceptors are down to the, uh, to the inner retina. In the inner retina, there are lots of neurons uh, that process the signals from the photoreceptor cells, bipolar cells, amacrine cells, horizontal cells, and then ganglion cells send the signals to the brain. So that's the overview of the retina. And what Michelle saw when she uh, put fluorescent glucose into the, uh, into the stomachs was in, in, in zebrafish, um, you can see uh, uh, the, the, the fluorescent glucose accumulated in the, uh, in the photoreceptor layer. And there's a little bit in the inner retinas, in, in, the, in the mouse retinas, and uh, in mouse retinas, there are uh, some capillaries that could feed those retinal neurons, but most of the glucose ended up in the photoreceptors. And the same thing in the zebrafish retina, they have mostly cone photoreceptors, they have a lot more cone photoreceptors in the zebrafish retina. And you can see the fluorescent glucose accumulating there. And we were wondering at the time whether the uh, Mueller cells, the glial cells, would take up the uh, fluorescent glucose. Doesn't look like they took up a whole lot of, uh, of, of glucose. Okay, so so how does the uh, how does the um, how does the oops how does the slide advance? How how does the uh, the glucose get from the blood uh, to the um, uh, to the uh, photo to the retina? And it turns out that um, in the, uh, in the uh, uh, pigment epithelium on the basal side, which is this side here, and on the apical side, which is this side here, <clears throat> there's a, uh, there are glucose transporters, GLUT1 in this case. And so this is, an, uh, this is a section staying with antibody to GLUT1. And so the glucose transporters are really abundant on, on both sides of the, uh, of the pigment epithelium. And so it's, the, it's those glucose transporters that uh, allow the glucose to flow uh, from the blood to the to the outer retina, and that's, that explains the result that Michelle uh, saw. So, um, so I want to go through a, a few experiments that other labs did in the past few years that uh, sort of led us to uh, led us with uh, experiments we were doing about the same time to this idea that the uh, retina in the eye uh, functions sort of as a as a metabolic ecosystem. And so, uh, in, in this experiment. <clears throat> This is an experiment done by uh, Nancy Philp and her colleagues at uh, Thomas Jefferson uh, University in, in Philadelphia. And what they did was they made a mouse uh, that had, um, uh, that ha it, it was mosaic for expression of these glucose transporters. And so they used a, uh, uh, they used a, a tree recombinase to knock out expression of uh, the glucose transporter, but the tree recombinase was driven by a promoter that is, um, uh, has mosaic expression. So it turns out that some, uh, some of the uh, RPE cells did not ex had lost expression of glu glucose transport, GLUT1, whereas other neighboring cells uh, did have GLUT1 expression. And so th those, those, those cells that had GLUT1 expression, uh, the glucose flowed to the retina. And what they found was, shown schematically, that the outer, the outer segments of the rod photoreceptors are nice and long and they go up and they actually touch the, the, the uh, apical surface of the pigment epithelium cells. Whereas where there was, uh, where there were no glucose transporters, uh, glucose didn't reach the uh, retina and the photoreceptors were stunted. 
So it's pretty clear that the photoreceptors need glucose to grow. And, so, and, and you know, they, they showed that the, the larger these patches where there's no glucose transporters, the shorter the, uh, uh, the photoreceptor outer segments were. So photoreceptors need glucose and they need glucose transporters on the pigment epithelium. Uh, here's another experiment. This was done by um, uh, Doug Dean and uh, Hank Kaplan at the University of Louisville, uh, also just a few years ago. And what they, what they did was they, uh, they worked with a, a, a mutant mouse uh, that had mutation in their rod photoreceptors so that the photoreceptors degenerated. And, uh, <clears throat> but the, the mutation affected only the rods. It, it, it was a, for a, a, a signal transduction gene phosphodesterase that was expressed only in the rods and not in the cones. So it shouldn't, it shouldn't affect the cones, but it does cause the rods to degenerate. So it turns out that the rods degenerated uh, shown schematically here, but um, in, in all these diseases uh, like this, uh, the cones, which are shown in these different colors here, they're, they're not degenerating. But it turned out when they looked at, they did the same kind of experiment that uh, Michelle did. They, uh, in this case, they injected into the tail vein, they injected uh, fluorescent glucose. And, uh, and what they saw was in the, you know, and normally the, 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 the fluorescent glucose would appear down here in the, in the photoreceptors like I, like I showed you. But uh, in this case, the, uh, the, the fluorescent glucose accumulated in the pigment epithelium. And it turns out that they, some, they did some beautiful studies showing that the, uh, uh, the, these, the photoreceptors have, um, the very tips, they, have, they don't have much ATP, so they expose phosphatidylserin in the tips, and that stimulates the tyrosine kinase receptor. And the stimulation of the tyrosine kinase uh, receptor um, normally uh, blocks the endocytosis of glucose transporters. But when the, when, the, when the receptor is not being stimulated, the glucose transporters get endocytose. So you have lots of glucose transporters up here, but you don't have any, you don't have any down here. You don't have any uh, on, this, on this apical side. And so all the glucose got stuck. They could see the RPE turn green. So the glucose was stuck. And because the glucose was stuck there, it made these cones very unhappy. The cones subsequently got really short and degenerated because they, they start to death. So that's another you know, piece of evidence that this whole thing is functioning as a uh, metabolic ecosystem. And the last example I want to give you is uh, from uh, Steve Sang's lab. And I won't go through the details of how they did this, but they were able to make uh, retinas that have either a very low density of photoreceptors or a very high density of photoreceptors. And it turned out when the density of photoreceptors was very low, uh, it, the, the glucose was not able to reach retinas and the outer segments were very short. Whereas when the density of photoreceptors is very high, you know, they're consuming a lot of glucose, but they're also stimulating, in this case, probably the glucose transporters to, uh, to be uh, uh, stabilized so that more glucose could be, could be transported. So again, the, all, these, all these observations uh, sort of suggested to us that the, uh, that the pigment epithelium, the, you know, the, the choroid, choroidal blood flow, pigment epithelium, and the photoreceptors sort of function all together. They, you know, they metabolically uh, you know, de de depend on each other. So, um, okay, so uh, not all of you guys think about energy metabolism every day. So I just wanna do what uh, I do every year uh, teaching undergraduates. So I just wanna give you a very brief primer on, uh, on energy metabolism. I know most of you have studied this probably since like high school and stuff, but just wanna review it a little bit. So when glucose enters a cell, it uh, goes through uh, uh, the steps of glycolysis. And you may remember that uh, initially there's some ATP investment, but in the end you actually end up producing more ATP than you use for, you know, for starting the process. And the other thing that's important to remember is that there's an oxidation step here. Uh, where when you make glyceraldehyde three phosphate, there's a glyceraldehyde three phosphate dehydrogenase that has to get oxidized, and that produces NADH. But it requires NAD to run glycolysis because it's an oxidation, uh, you know, it's an oxidative process. And so then you form this three carbon molecule pyruvate, uh, which can enter uh, the mitochondria. So it's designated mitochondria here. And if the pyruvate gets in the mitochondria after a few cycles of the citric acid cycle. The, uh, uh, it, the, all, the, all the carbons from the three carbon pyruvate get converted, get oxidized to, to CO2. And in the process of doing that, they make NADH and the NADH transfers its electrons to oxygen uh, to make water. And uh, in the process of doing that, when those electrons, when the oxygen sucks those electrons out of the, uh, uh, you know, across the, through the uh, uh, inner membrane, um, 
it uh, drives proton transport, and I'm sure you remember there's a, there's a proton-driven ATP synthase that, that, makes AT, that makes ATP. Okay, so, uh, and then what happens, the pyruvate gets in the mitochondria, and this is the citric acid cycle. I just wanna remind you of a couple of things that the uh, uh, acetyl-CoA gives up two carbons to this four, car and it, it condenses with this four carbon molecule, oxaloacetate, to make citrate. And then, uh, then there's these oxidation reactions that generate NADH, and that produces reducing power, and that enters that electron transport cascade, transfers electrons to, to oxygen, make water, and, and pumps protons. So there's a, so alpha ketoglutarate is five carbons. This is a, another decarboxylation step, or oxidative decarboxylation step. I want to emphasize these molecules here, succinate and fumarate, because we're going to be talking a lot about those uh, later. And that uh, succinate also um, gets oxidized uh, to make fumarate. It's a single bond, a double bond here. And, uh, and that produces FADH. So that also, those electrons also get transferred to oxygen. All this is happening in the mitochondrial matrix. And there's the NADH. Okay, so I just want to mention this one thing uh, briefly, because uh, I'm not going to focus on this, on this in this talk. But uh, Michelle Giamarco, uh, working uh, with Sue Brockerhoff, uh, has done this really beautiful study, uh, and, and also uh, with, with Ed Parker, who did all the electron microscopy. Um, she did this really beautiful study um, uh, looking at the morphology of uh, mitochondria in zebrafish cone photoreceptors. And it's, it's really amazing. They have these enormous clusters. See, these, this represents the di different zebrafish cones. They have the nor these enormous clusters of mitochondria. And so Michelle uh, you know, quantified the number of mitochondria and their shape and their, everything and, and showed how they, they changed during, during the day. And so, the, uh, so Sue's lab, uh, Sue and uh, Sue Brockhoff in particular has been studying, focusing on these uh, mitochondria. And there's other, several other papers that they've uh, published recently. Um, uh, and Michelle showed that the uh, mitochondria are able to uh, separate distinct pools of calcium in the, in the different compartments of the photoreceptor cell. And then uh, Rachel Hutto has overexpressed and, and, uh, and Celia Bisbach has, has knocked out uh, this uh, calcium uh, uniporter. That's one of the main routes by which calcium uh, gets into, but not the only route by which calcium gets into the, uh, into the mitochondria. And then Jin Haidu, and he was a postdoc in my lab, and then, and then he's got his own lab now, and he, he's been studying this mitochondrial pyruvate carrier that lets, uh, the, so lets the pyruvate into the, uh, into the mitochondrial matrix for pyruvate dehydrogenase activity. But the, the reason, one reason I wanted to show you this is, is to emphasize that the photoreceptors have really large, uh, really abundant uh, uh, and very active uh, mitochondria. When, and we'll be getting back to that uh, in a little bit. So, so the way mitochondria work uh, for, uh, for respiration is that they have uh, these respiratory complexes in the, in the uh, inner membrane of the mitochondria. Remember, there's an outer membrane and an inner membrane of the, uh, of the mitochondria. And so, uh, so glucose gets oxidized, produces NADH. Uh, NADH comes from those, uh, those, de de uh, those um, dehydrogenase reactions in the uh, mitochondria. And uh, there's this respiratory complex called complex one. <clears throat> it's complex because it has many, many proteins in it. Um, and the, the electrons get transferred uh, through complex one to this small hydrophobic molecule uh, called ubiquinone. And, uh, and that can be reduced to make ubiquinol, which is designated here as QH2. So these electrons can be transferred. Succinate, that molecule I told you about before, um, is uh, in a citric acid cycle. Also, it can get oxidized and give up its electrons also to, uh, to ubiquinone and to make ubiquinol. And then the electrons go to cytochrome C, they reduce that. And then ultimately, those electrons get transferred to oxygen. And I had a little animation here. Yeah, there it is. You can see that it jiggling. So uh, oxygen is uh, this really high energy, uh, the oxygen molecule is this really high energy molecule uh, because it, it's, it's held together by these double bonds, but at the same time has these lone pair electrons that are like repelling each other and it's you know, being held together by these double bonds. And so it basically wants to explode. And the way you can get it to explode is to give it some hydrogen atoms with electrons and it forms this very stable wa molecule water. And so, so having oxygen here at the end is basically like a suction that's sort of drawing the electrons through this respiratory cascade. And when those electrons are pulled through the electron, through this cascade, they pump protons and the proton gradient is used to make ATP. So oxygen is a really good acceptor for electrons that really drives this whole system. Okay, so getting back to the uh, mitochondria again. <clears throat> 
there was this uh, really beautiful study uh, done, uh, published by Jan Provis's lab a few years ago, where they uh, quantif quantified the distribution of mitochondria in a retina. And uh, they showed that th there's these uh, enormous mitochondria and is part of the photoreceptor. So this is the outer segment. This is what's called the ellipsoid. The synapse is way down here. And this is the nucleus of the, uh, of the photoreceptor, rod photoreceptor cell. And here are those RPE cells that I was telling you about. And these are the choroidal endothelial cells in the, in the, in the Brooks membrane. And so, the, uh, 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 so it turns out <clears throat> that uh, the, the, these uh, mitochondria are enormous. And, um, and this is uh, when Stephanie Sloat was uh, working in our lab a few years ago. She uh, did this beautiful serial block face uh, scanning electron microscopy analyses of the photoreceptor mitochondria. And so these, these here are the rod photoreceptor mitochondria in this ellipsoid region here. And these uh, little dots here, these are uh, at the ends of the Mueller cells. They have little apical processes. They have uh, mitochondria at, uh, at the base of each of those little apical processes. And then the other uh, interesting type of mitochondria is, uh, is in the pigment epithelium cells. So remember all the oxygen and nutrients are coming from here, from these, uh, choroidal, uh, the choroidal blood flow. <clears throat> and so, uh, so these, it turns out that um, this group, I um, always have trouble with his name, Rat, uh, Arjuna Ratnayaka uh, at the University of Southampton in England. They, uh, uh, they did, also did serial block phase scanning EM and, and, and localized the, and, and looked at the structures of the uh, uh, mitochondria in these pigment epithelium cells. And it really clustered up near just the way they showed it in, a, in Jan Provis's study. They really clustered up next to the uh, next to the blood flow, and there's a lot of those mitochondria. So the, the RP is a lot of mitochondria. Okay, so um, okay, so what I've told you so far is uh, that the photoreceptors have a lot of mitochondria, uh, and the RP also has mitochondria. But when you look at the uh, me energy metabolism of these two tissues, uh, they're actually incredibly different. Uh, not incredibly, they, they're very different. They're, they're believably different, not unbelievably different. So the, uh, if, you, if you take a retina and put it in a dish with glucose and you measure uh, the concentration of glucose with time, uh, the retina is, is, does a really good job at depleting the, the medium of, of the glucose. Whereas if you take the same number of eye cups, so these are eye cups from which the retinas have been removed. So the most metabolically tissue there is the pigment epithelium cells. If you, if, you, if you put those in the dish, they take up they consume glucose, but much slower than the uh, than the retina does. And then if you if you look at um, if you look at lactate <clears throat> uh, production, so um, so I, when I was reviewing glycolysis before, I, I was going to mention, but I forgot that if the mitochondria can't take up the pyruvate fast enough, uh, the NADH that's made by glycolysis can be used to reduce the pyruvate to lactate. And that regenerates NAD, so that the uh, um, so that the uh, uh, so the glycolysis can continue. And it turns out that the retinas do that really well. They uh, they produce huge amounts of lactate, just like they consume glucose really fast. Whereas the eye cups, or these are cultured uh, retinal pigment epithelium cells, uh, they they uh, can, they produce lactate. They consume glucose and produce lactate much more slowly. Okay. So these these metab the energy metabolism in these in these different tissues is extremely is extremely different. Okay, now I want to also review a little bit about uh, metabolic flux because that's that's one of the uh, uh, techniques that we use uh, a lot in our lab. And so basically, what if you take a tissue, take some cells or a tissue, and you feed them uh, carbon thirteen labeled uh, fuel. What happen and what happens is under ideal conditions where you have the culture condition just right the amount of a given metabolite will, will stay constant. But um, the amount of carbon-12, which is the, normally the most abundant iso isomer of uh, carbon in our, in our bodies, uh, the, the amount of carbon-12 labeled metabolite will, will decrease as it's replaced by uh, the carbon-13 labeled metabolite. And you can quantify this by mass spectrometry. And we, we did uh, these experiments. Uh, <clears throat> also, every, uh, Almost everybody in the lab has been trained by Martin Sadelak in the chemistry department to, uh, to do the mass spectrometry analyses. And so, um, so Jin Hai Du, and he was in our lab and a few years ago and uh, working with Jen Chow, who's really excellent at culturing uh, 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 retinal pigment epithelium cells, uh, did these experiments where they compared metabolic flux uh, from uh, 
uh, uh, in the uh, retina versus in this case, it was a cultured uh, pigment of thionic cells. And so they fed them uh, C13 labeled glucose and they looked at how much C13 pyruvate was made. And very quickly, uh, the, the C12 pyruvate pools in the cell were replaced by th C13 uh, pyruvate. But then when they looked at lactate, and this is lactate in the cells, uh, the, the, the retina, which is in, always in red, the retina will be in red. So retina produced huge amounts of lactate much faster than the pigment epithelium cells. And we've seen this over and over again. This is, and, and this is a, it's actually a classic observation that Otto Warburg made in the 1920s. Uh, and he was, he was studying, he was, you know, they were just learning how, uh, you know, what, uh, what oxi oxidation of, of glucose, uh, you know, how that, how that works. And they, and they discovered that there were two tissues uh, that would convert glucose uh, to lactate uh, even when oxygen was abundant, even when there was oxygen from the mitochondria used. One was uh, tumor tissues and the other was the, uh, was the retina. So, uh, so that, that's a very old observation. So that, uh, of course, they didn't look at the pigment epithelium, but the, but the retina is, has, uh, uh, is, is very uh, active at, at, uh, at doing glycolysis and converting the um, uh, carbons to lactate. And then, uh, so then uh, uh, they also looked at the mitochondria and the retina actually uh, takes up the, the label pyruvate into citrate, the label carbons from pyruvate into citrate very rapidly, but there's only a very small pool of citrate compared to the RPE. So the RPE is a little bit slower, but the, uh, but, but the, the pool size is larger. And then if you, the same thing is true for these other mitochondrial intermediates, alpha ketoglutarate and malate, uh, the pool, size are, 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 pool sizes are much larger in the uh, in the pigment epithelium than in the and then in the retina. So, bottom line of all this, and there, there's many more experiments that, that support this idea now. Uh, but the bottom line is that the the retinal pigment epithelium has a more mitochondrial based metabolism, and the uh, and the retina uh, has a very glycolysis based metabolism. So, um, <clears throat> so this, all these observations led to this idea. That the uh, uh, the retina in the RP function is, a, is a, like an, a metabolic ecosystem, and and so what we know from uh, the experiments I showed you at the very beginning is that if you if you put uh, glucose glucose from the from the blood can get through this RP cell because they have glucose transporters and it can get to the retina and the retina the photoreceptors in the retina uh, con convert that to lactate. Uh, but you know that there's one problem here is what, what about the what about the poor RPE? What does that do for fuel? Because it it has to uh, it has to allow the glucose to flow through. It can't consume the glucose, otherwise the, the retina would starve. Okay, and so that got us to thinking. Well, maybe um, maybe the uh, uh, the RPE actually uses the lactate uh, because there's still some energy left in here. Uh, this is this is only partially reduced compared uh, compared to pyruvate. Uh, but, but but you can also oxidize uh, lactate if you get those oxygens to suck the electrons out of the uh, out of the lactate molecule. Uh, <clears throat> but there's uh, well, so so uh, in order to for, to do that, the lactate has to go back to the uh, uh, to the RPE and uh, and uh, be oxidized by NAD uh, to produce pyruvate, which then would enter the mitochondria. And get oxidized by the pathway I was, I was telling about before. Ultimately, uh, the electrons would be accepted by uh, by oxygen, and you could use that to make ATP. So that would be a way to provide fuel for the uh, for the RPE cells. And so, uh, so we tested that idea. And uh, uh, there's a whole other story that I won't be going into, but it also turns out that the Mueller cells could be another. Uh, type of cell that uses that doesn't use glucose, but all but uses lactate instead. That's a whole separate story. So this might be a solution for how the RPE can survive. And uh, <clears throat> not only that, if this was true, uh, if, if this really happens, then uh, since glycolysis, so we want the RPE to allow glucose to flow through without being consumed. And glycolysis needs NAD uh, to consume uh, the glucose. And so an advantage of using lactate would be the lactate would consume NAD, so there wouldn't be any NAD left to do glycolysis. So we asked the question, what if you take RPE cells and feed them C13 lactate? So in this experiment, we fed them either C13 glucose or we fed them C13 lactate. We measured how much citrate, uh, C13 labeled citrate was made from the C13 lactate. 
And uh, it's lactate works much better as a fuel for the RPE cells than, than glucose does. So this supports our idea uh, that lactate uh, is the fuel that RPE cells use so they don't have to use glucose and so that more glucose can flow through and get to the retina. And we saw the same thing for alpha ketoglutarate. Turns out pyruvate can be uh, carboxylated. And uh, so it, uh, it, when it, it gets carboxylated, that makes oxaloacetate, which makes malate. So we can detect that too. So that reaction also works much better with lactate than with uh, glucose. But I don't want to leave you with the impression that we completely understand this system uh, because it turns out if you look at another metabolite, succinate, it's, it's exactly the opposite. So for some reason, I don't think we still quite understand this, but succinate uh, is made from carbons from, uh, from glucose better than, than it is from lactate. And you'll see in a, in a few minutes that succinate also has some other really interesting properties in the RP. So this is all done in, in RP cells, right? Okay, so uh, it, it, it turns out that that's one way that the RPE can, can get fuel without, uh, so that it doesn't have to consume glucose. But uh, I, I think the RPE is, is kind of like a scavenger. It's, it's so important for the RPE to not use glucose that there's all these other fuels that it can use. So it can use fatty acids, it can use glutamine, it can use proline uh, and other amino acids. A lot of this work was done uh, by Jin Hai Du, uh, who's now at the, uh, West Virginia University and has, has his own lab there. And he's been studying uh, the, the, the different types of fuels that the, uh, that the RPE cells can use. And, and the fatty acid analyses were done by uh, Nancy Philp and and Kathy Bose for Taglia at, at Thomas Jefferson and University of Pennsylvania. Um, but, uh, but what I want to tell you about now is another story what, about how the, uh, uh, the RP also can use uh, succinate. <clears throat> okay, so, um, so this, I showed you this before. This is the, the distribution of the different types of mitochondria in the RP cells and the photoreceptor cells and the Mueller glial cells. And so, you, you know, you're probably thinking I'm kind of nuts because I'm, I'm, I'm telling you that the, that the retina is very glycolytic. And I keep telling you how uh, the, the retina also has these enormous um, mitochondria. Um, and, they're, and they're also, you know, they're enormous. There's, uh, there's lots of them and they're, and they're very active. And so it's, it's actually even worse than that because it turns out that there's actually not even very much oxygen in the retina where all those, all those mitochondria are. So how, how, do you, how do you explain that? So, well, th th this is the, uh, uh, th this, these are the experiments that show that there's not very much oxygen in the retina. And they're done by this guy, Rob, uh, Rob Linsenmeyer at Northwestern University. And it's also uh, by a guy, um, uh, Stephen uh, Kringle uh, in uh, Western Australia. Done, did, did very similar types of experiments. And what they did was they, uh, uh, they, they took oxygen sensitive electrodes and they uh, stuck them through uh, the sclera of the eye and then uh, through the, the vitreous of the eye, and then, uh, and then to, the, to the retina, poked it through the retina all the way back to, to the pigment epithelium, all the way back to the uh, choroidal blood flow where uh, oxygen concentration would be greatest. And they also measured the oxygen concentration going, uh, of the uh, art arteries you know, going into the eye and of the, of, of the veins coming out of the eye. And, uh, and it turns out that the oxygen concentration, these are estimates, so uh, can't compare these directly, but. The oxygen concentration in the even in the RPE is probably a little bit lower than the than the oxygen uh, levels in the blood coming out of the eye. So it probably means that the RPE is consuming some oxygen. But by the time you get down to the middle uh, to the inner uh, to the to the retina where the photoreceptor uh, mitochondria are, so this these are the this is the photoreceptor layer right here. These this is the ganglion cell layer right here. Um, there there's there's essentially no oxygen. Um, it's, it's, you know, there's, there's no oxygen for these mitochondria to use, or, or they've used it all up. And, and the explanation for this increasing a little bit is that in the macaque retinas, there are some uh, blood vessels, there are some capillaries on, in the inner retina. That's, that's true in our retinas, all, human retinas, mouse retinas. It's not true in, in rabbits and uh, guinea pigs and, and, and zebrafish retinas don't have very many capillaries in the inner retina. So those actually, when they do those experiments, they, 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 they sort of flatten line out. There's no, there's no oxygen at all in the, uh, in the innermost parts of, of the retina. So the retina is really hypoxic, but you have all these mitochondria there. <clears throat> okay, so let me remind you again about uh, what, what happens in this respiratory cascade. The, the oxygen, remember the oxygen wants electrons more than, any, more than most, almost all of the molecules. And so it sucks these electrons through, through 
uh, here, and, and also sucks all the electrons from the succinate um, uh, to uh, you know put them on put the electrons into QH two, and then and then onto oxygen to make water. So there's a lot really strong driving force for those reactions. But turns out <clears throat> that this reaction here, succinate going to fumarate, it turns out that that has a standard free energy change of uh, almost of about zero. And if you remember from your freshman chemistry classes, a standard free energy change about zero means that at equilibrium, you have roughly equal concentrations of the substrates and the products. And so if you, if you increase the concentration of fumarate, uh, you can drive the reaction this way. If you increase the concentration of QH2, you can, you can drive that reaction towards succinate. So what happens then in the retina where there's very little oxygen? And in fact, uh, Dan Haas in the lab has shown that, um, that it seems like in the retina, uh, there's less of this cytochrome oxidase complex four compared to the, uh, compared to, uh, the uh, complex one that produces these electrons, puts them on, that takes these electrons and puts them onto QH2. So what happens when you have very low oxygen and low uh, concentrations of this complex four uh, is that you would build up QH2. And so if you build up QH2, you might actually take, instead of using oxygen to the, accept the electrons, you could just take fumarate with that, that um, oops. I thought I had it, but the, uh, you, could, you could take fumarate <clears throat> and uh, uh, it's got a double bond. You can reduce that double bond to a single bond to make, to make succinate. Okay, so, uh, so at the time we were starting to think about this, Celia Bisbach, a uh, graduate student lab, was coming up with some experiments, some, you know, uh, some results that we hadn't predicted, some sort of anomalous uh, results, which also started to make a lot of sense when we started to think about it this way. And so Celia did this experiment. She, uh, she took mouse retinas and she fed them uh, C13 labeled malate, this molecule right here. And, uh, and then she measured the, uh, how well the, that the carbon 13 from malate could be converted into succinate. And she did this with RPE cells and it didn't, it didn't happen. But when she did this with retinal cells, she fed them C13 malate and the, and the C13 malate got incorporated. So there's a time course. And it's, this is number, the picomoles per microgram of protein. And so she saw that the, uh, the C13 malate that she added accumulated in the retinal tissue, in the retinal uh, tissue. Uh, and then after a short delay, she saw that that C13 malate did in fact get converted into C13 uh, succinate. And this was happening even under uh, conditions where there's 20% oxygen in, the, in, the, in these culture dishes. But we did, this, we did these kind of experiments in, under uh, hypoxic, a much lower oxygen concentration, and then enhance these reactions even, even further. So it probably does this because uh, there's the, the cytochrome oxidase levels are low relative to the uh, amount of uh, uh, complex one. So, that, so that's our model. It's, it's, we, we think that the, uh, you know, the retina is, uh, has very low oxygen, so uh, it, it, can't, um, it can't use oxygen to accept those electrons. Um, <clears throat> instead, what it does is uses fumarate to, uh, and, and this double bond here gets converted to single, gets reduced to a single bond by these electrons. So in other words, in the retina, because there's no oxygen around, uh, fumarate acts like a surrogate uh, for, uh, for the oxygen. Okay, so then we wondered what, what happens to uh, the succinate. <clears throat> and so to analyze that, we collaborated with Ian Sweet, uh, whose lab is, is, is actually uh, very close to ours. And Ian developed this, um, uh, this instrument, this really amazing instrument for measuring oxygen consumption, where uh, basically he takes a tube and you can take the tissue, the uh, retinas or the eye cups, and you can uh, embed them in, this, in, 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 in these beads. You have a porous frit on either side. And then you flow an oxygenated medium uh, through, uh, through the system and you measure, uh, the, you, use, uh, um, you, you use a chemical that uh, sensitive to oxygen to measure the, uh, the oxygen concentration before and after it goes uh, through, th over, the, over the tissue. And uh, it, it also in, in, its, uh, in, in the newer versions of the system, he has a gas permeable tubing, tubing so you can very precisely control the level of oxygen or, or hydrogen sulfide, whatever other gas you want to, uh, you want to use. And so uh, we used to, uh, we did these experiments with this system. It actually is an older version of this. And I think these experiments were done by Austin Roundtree when he was uh, in, in uh, Ian's lab. But what we found was really interesting. If we, if we measured oxygen consumption by the retina <clears throat> and we added succinate, 
So our model is that the retina is producing succinate, not using it. Uh, so there was, you know, slight increase in oxygen consumption, but not much. And we give a glutamine. We also, get, you know, get get a little bit of oxygen, more oxygen consumption over what we, we have with, with glucose. Uh, but we do the same experiment with the eye cups. We see this enormous increase with uh, when we add succinate uh, compared to uh, just glucose alone. And the, one of the really great aspects of that apparatus that Ian uh, has uh, built is that it's uh, you can you can demonstrate re re reversibility. So in this case, we took away the succinate and it went right back down to normal and we can measure uh, the oxygen consumption by glutamine. So uh, it's stimulated by glutamine. So lactate, glutamine, proline, none of those had anywhere near as much of an effect as the, uh, as the succinate did. So here's our, you know, our current working model. We think that the electrons from glucose you know, being made in pyruvate, all those go into NADH. Uh, they, they increase the concentration of, of, of ubiquinol and those electrons can't be transferred to, to oxygen. So instead they're, they're transferred to succinate. And so the, the, uh, the succinate is made in the retina. These are the photoreceptor cells. The succinate's made in the retina uh, and, and it's exported. And Celia Bisbach is, is in the process of trying to identify what the uh, transporters are for, uh, for succinate going out of the retina and uh, into the RPE. Um, <clears throat> and so when you get to the RPE, then the succinate can be oxidized to fumarate. And there, there's plenty of oxygen available to the RPE. So in that case, it, it can it can transfer those electrons to oxygen, and then the carbons get shuttled back. And so uh, this is basically a, a shuttle to take electrons from the retina to to the uh, um, to the pigment of epithelium uh, and then to oxygen. So uh, we published this um, um, last year, and what we're what we're doing now is uh, and, and and Celia and Dan, I think I already mentioned them. Uh, did these uh, uh, did those were primarily responsible for those experiments? So what Dan is is exploring now is whether these uh, the, the this is you know this could be something it's all an artifact of doing these experiments uh, ex vivo, and so we want to know if it's actually occurring in vivo. So what Dan uh, did in collaboration with Elizabeth Gehring, Thomas Mundinger, and, and Sakini Zrike, so showed uh, uh, did was a uh, set up a catheter attached to the jugular vein of, of mice, and they infused into the uh, into the mouse. Uh, in this case, C13 malate. And so, in our model, um, the malate would go into the retina, be converted to fumarate, and then uh, so that's a hydration a dehydration reaction. It gets dehydrated, fumarate, and then the fumarate would get converted would take the electrons from the, the glucose being made in pyruvate. Uh, in NADH, take those electrons to reduce the fume rate to succinate. And so what Dan did here was he measured the ratio of this product succinate to fume rate, succinate to fume rate uh, as a function of time in the uh, RPE cells and in the retina. And sure enough, consistent with what we think is happening um, the, in the retina, but not in the RPE, we detected evidence for this reaction happening, that the male is going to fume rate, going to, suc going to succinate. Um, with, with you know with the carbon thirteen labels, and then just one other experiment. So Dan's been doing a whole bunch of these experiments, but just one other sort of excerpt of what he's been doing is is we wanted to see what uh, if the RPE is really good at, at oxidizing succinate to fumarate, and so uh, so in this case they infused C thirteen succinate, and then uh, they looked at various tissues uh, for evidence of succinate getting converted to fumarate. And the tissue that had the highest ratio of the product to the, the to the substrate, fumarate to the succinate, was in, in fact the uh, the eye cups with the, with the, with the pigment epithelium. So these you know these these re results suggest that it really is happening uh, in vivo. And the, the other the other direction we're, we're thinking about going with this is is uh, we started wondering why is the, why is the retina so hypoxic, and um, and I think a good analogy might be. Uh, that it's like a light bulb. And so the light bulb has this, you know, tungsten filament. And if you run electricity uh, through a tungsten filament, it gets really hot and it burns away. So if, you know, if you ever crack the light bulb and turn it on, you see it, the filament burns immediately. And that's because the, uh, the light bulb has all the oxygen pumped out of it. It's replaced with some inert gas. Uh, so there's no oxygen. And it could be that, you know, so the retina is exposed to a lot of light and has all these uh, polyenes, has these... Uh, uh, molecules that when they absorb light, they, they, can, uh, they can break down and form uh, aldehydes and things like that. They react with protein, form reactive oxygen species. 
So you don't want that to happen. So one way, maybe one way to protect the retina is to make it hypoxic, is, to, is for the pigment epithelium to use the succinate to reduce the oxygen in the water before the oxygen could ever get to the retina. And that, you know, that fits with the retina having very low levels of oxygen. Okay, so, um, so, uh, so this poster says uh, science in, in medicine. And so I, I read that and I realized that, uh, you know, mostly uh, uh, up until now, I've just talked about uh, science and, and, and nothing about medicine. And these are really, um, you know, recent observations. And so there hasn't really been an opportunity that much to, to, to translate it into uh, any, any kind of medicine. But I, I will tell you the, the directions I think that this is going. And so, um, so to take, for example, this disease, retinitis pigmentosa, where the rod photoreceptors uh, degenerate. And there's like 70 different genes that have been uh, linked to that disease, like 3,000 different mutations. And in this disease, the rod photoreceptors degenerate that causes night blindness. Now, after the rods degenerate, uh, the, like I think I showed you in the earlier slide, the, uh, after the rods degenerate, even though the cones aren't directly affected by the mutation, the cones degenerate, they, and they probably starve. And so uh, this, you know, this kind of seems like might be an, an ecosystem problem. So is there anything that we can do to, uh, you know, to slow uh, or prevent this from happening? And, and, and so the other problem is that if you wanna, um, if you wanna treat retinitis pigmentosa, you would have to have 70 different uh, gene therapies. Uh, and each one of those is extremely hard to develop and very expensive. And so is there some other approach that could be taken that might be more general? And so you can make this hypothesis, and I, I think a lot of people are sort of thinking that this might be true, that, uh, that the, uh, the, the photoreceptor cell is going through daily oscillations in, um, in its metabolic state. And uh, if it has a mutation that's really stressful, uh, occasionally it might dip into some you know, threshold for cell death. And uh, whereas if, if we could do something based on what we're finding with this you know, metabolic ecosystem, uh, it, it, you know, we might be able to boost this uh, up a little bit so that the frequency at which these, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the cells dip into this death zone would be slower. And, you know, this, this happens over in humans, it happens over decades of life. So it is a slow process. And it's only every, every once in a while, you know, a few cells die here and there, but if you can keep those cells from dying, maybe that would, that would help. And so, uh, so um, we've been working with a, a guy named Steve Sang at Columbia University. And, and people who study these retinal degenerative diseases do it, something like this. They, one of the best ways to study it is to look at the thickness of the, uh, of the outer nuclear layer. That's the, that's the photoreceptor, uh, the nuclei of the photoreceptors. And, and so at four weeks for this particular uh, mutation, and it's in the phosphodesterase, um, there's a lot of photoreceptor nuclei at four weeks, but you sit six, six weeks and eight weeks you can see that the photoreceptors have died. The rod photoreceptors have died. They, their nuclei, the whole cell is gone. And so that's, that's how you sort of quantify the, the, uh, the degeneration of the photoreceptors. Another way to quantify it is by electroretinography. And so you can, you can uh, stick an electrode on the, on the cornea. And it turns out when you shine light on the photoreceptors, they're all facing in the same direction. So you induce an electric field. Um, and, and, and you can detect that on the cornea compared to the rest of the animal. And so when you flash, in response to a flash of light, you get a negative potential in the cornea, and then, uh, and then it goes positive as the uh, inner retinal neurons uh, start to respond. And this is a bright flash and a dim flash. <clears throat> but if you have photoreceptor degeneration, it's just flat line, there's no, there's no response. Okay, so here's our model. Uh, so, uh, you know, I told you glucose gets through the RP, it gets in the retina. There's a lot of glycolysis to make lactate. The lactate can feed the mitochondria. And then we have this other one, this other cycle here, where succinate is a carrier of electrons uh, to the to the uh, to the pigment epithelium. And so we, uh, Steve Sang, uh, very fortunately for us, got you know very interested in this in this whole idea of there being a, a metabolic ecosystem. And he's a clinician, science, physician, and scientist, and so he's very interested in, in you know trying to exploit this to uh, uh, to come up with uh, therapies. And so what they did was they uh, they made a, a mouse model. Uh, in which they enhance glycolysis in, in, the, in, the, in the retina. And so uh, Brian Robbins, a, a technician in our lab, uh, did the uh, mass spectrometry analysis of these retinas, and he showed that the, the, the mutant is in blue. So the mutant is with enhanced glycolysis, and the, and the, and the, uh, this is the control. Um, and both of these were done in retinal degeneration mutants, um, but at an earlier at a stage before any degeneration had actually happened. And so it turned out that in the mutant, uh, 
uh, as we predicted, when, when they enhanced glycolysis, uh, we, we saw a faster formation of these glycolytic intermediates. But when we look at mitochondrial intermediates, even though more pyruvate was being made, there wasn't more citrate, more labeled uh, glutamate, malate, oxaloacetate. In fact, when you look at oxaloacetate, which is e equilibrium with aspartate, uh, mitochondrial activity is, is even slower. And that's what you'd expect from, from, this, from this mutation that, that, uh, that stabilizes hypoxia-inducible factor, which, which is, you know, increases glycolysis. Okay, so what does that do? It actually, it actually prolongs the survival of the photoreceptor. So we made the retina even more glycolytic than it normally is, and that caused the photoreceptors to uh, die at a slower rate. So at eight weeks, you can see there's more uh, photoreceptor nuclei. And you can see uh, at, at eight weeks, it's a stronger... Uh, photoreceptor response in the in the mutants that had enhanced glycolysis in the retina. All right, but what about the other uh, other side of this? What about these mitochondria? So, so, uh, so the more active the mitochondria are in the RPE, the less they'll depend on glycolysis. <clears throat> and also, and by you know, by one one of our hypotheses, the more uh, active the mitochondria are, the more they're going to consume oxygen. So the less oxygen will get to the retina to cause uh, damage. So it could, it could protect them. And so uh, Steve, Sang, Steve Sang's lab also uh, made a, a, a design an experiment so they could increase mitochondrial biogenesis in the RPE cells. And so they, uh, uh, they uh, it was a, I think it was PGC1, it was PGC1 alpha, which is a protein that will increase mitochondrial biogenesis. Uh, they used adeno-associated virus with an RPE-specific promoter uh, to express the uh, uh, the uh, protein that enhances mitochondrial biogenesis in the RP cells. And this just demonstrates the specificity of their, their promoter. So they injected this adenine associated virus into one eye, and they did a sham injection on the other eye. And then they then they compared, uh, they looked at the control eye. So th again, this was done in the PD6 mutant where the photoreceptors are degenerating at a particular, normally at a particular rate. But what, uh, and so they saw fewer uh, rod and nuclei, photoreceptor nuclei, it's a small ERG response. But when they uh, increase mitochondrial biogenesis in the RPE cells, so these are the cells that are down here, they didn't, the, the expression of the protein is not happening in the photoreceptors, it's happening down here. They uh, prolong the survival of the photoreceptors and enhance the ERGs. So, uh, so you know that's that's where we are right now. We, we, you know, we're thinking we can exploit this system by uh, enhancing glycolysis or uh, or enhancing mitochondrial activity in RP. Uh, and and if we can do that, maybe it would be possible to slow the rates of degeneration uh, uh, for not only this disease but many other uh, photoreceptor degenerative diseases. So, um, so I'll stop there. One person I really want to thank is, is Martin uh, Sadlek. Uh, like I told you, he's the, uh, he runs a mass spectrometry facility in the, in the chemistry department. This is after a bike ride a few months ago, and we were all jumping down after the, to celebrate the ride. And um, uh, one thing I discovered is that Martin has the longest, uh, longest hang time of anybody I know. Um, and, and I also want to uh, really thank all the people that, we've, that I've worked with over the years. The ones in bold are the ones that have been working on uh, various aspects of this uh, metabolism project. And uh, I have to say, I, I think uh, it's probably true that even though I'm the one they call professor, I probably learn more, uh, more from them than, than I have, uh, have taught them. So uh, you know, I really appreciate the, having had the opportunity to work with all these guys. And I'll stop there and uh, take questions. Yeah, great. Thanks very much, Jim. We do have uh, about five minutes or so and a couple of questions. You did talk about this, but we have a question that asks what prevents glucose from being metabolized by the RPE? Would you like to hit that again? Yeah, so, well, I, I, think, I think it's because the RPE uses uh, uh, all, these other, all these other fuels. And uh, like I said, the lactate can use up the uh, uh, NAD that's required for, uh, for glycolysis. And, um, I, th I think the levels of the glycolytic enzymes and the RP might be low. It might be, you know, uh, less hexokinase and, 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 and other enzymes, but still a little bit of a mystery to us why, uh, what, 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 keeps, what keeps the RP activity so, and also what, what keeps the, uh, uh, the retina activity, uh, glycolytic activity very high. The, 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 the glycolytic intermediates are actually at a very low concentration in retina but the flux to those inter intermediates is, is extremely high. So we don't know 
Yeah. Oh, sorry. Another question here. Are, are there dietary supplements or vitamins that can naturally slow down retinal degeneration or might be expected to, especially as a function of aging? Yeah, it's a really it's a really good question. We don't know. Some people are trying to uh, um, uh, so NAD precursors uh, in, in, in some experiments. People who study aging are finding that can that can slow aging. And there's there's some labs that are they're trying those uh, now to see if if they can s slow these degeneration. And I don't know that they really have been effective yet. But but um, and then exercise also is another uh, uh, way that people uh, Jeff Boatwright's group at Emory University. Has been has been uh, testing the effects of exercise on uh, the, the the rate of degeneration of some of these some of these mutants. Great. Um, I those are the only uh, questions that I see. I'll give just a moment. Oh, here's one. Uh, might the RPE use more glucose if they were made hypoxic? Uh, this would be a test of why glucose usage is limited, or might be a test. Yeah, so I don't think we've. I I, I would predict that it would, and um, I, yeah, so I, I can tell you. I can, to, yeah, I think Ian Sweet wants to do another experiment with you here. <laughs> yeah, so actually, if you if you uh, so TFAM is like a transcription factor uh, required for 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 mitochondria, and people have knocked out TFAM in the RPE cells, so the mitochondria in the RPE uh, uh, are not active, and. What happens then is that the RP becomes very glycolytic, and all the photoreceptors die. And so I, th I think I, I think what's what's happening there, it, 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 you know, what's what's happening there is that the uh, the RP is using all the glucose before it can get to the retina, so the so the photoreceptors starve. Okay, Ian says he's up for the experiment. Um, <laughs> an, 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 another one here. Uh, so, what are all the mitochondria in photoreception in photoreceptors doing? <laughs> I don't think I've ever given a seminar where somebody didn't ask me that question. So, uh, so I, I think the uh, uh, so the mitochondria are so all those um, TCA cycle intermediates that I that I showed you. Many of those are precursors uh, for things like amino acids, and and so I think one of the things one of the things that you have to have mitochondrial activity to uh, to generate those. And, uh, and and like I said, the, the, there is a lot of mitochondrial activity even in the even in the absence of oxygen. And the way the system has adapted to it is by using a, a, a surrogate to ex to accept the electron. So you can still keep that cycle going, at least parts of the cycle going, um, you know, by by making by transferring electrons to succinate. All right, great, Jim. Uh, we have a certificate to commemorate your. Um, uh, actually being invited to speak uh, by your peers here, uh, which is uh, you know an accomplishment indeed. And we'll get that off to you soon here. But I'd like to thank you very much uh, and all the attendees. And I'm sure if you have additional questions, you can get Jim by uh, email and he'd be happy to answer. I will, thank you very much. Okie doke. Thank you all, see ya. Bye.